Hello and welcome to Backstage with Gig Performer. My name is Brett Pontecorvo and we are here every Thursday, 1130 a.m. sharing how people are using Gig Performer, some great tips, tricks, best practices, all of that um, great stuff. If you are here, please let us know you're here. Say hello in the comments. We'd love to connect with you. I already see we've got Omri Cohen. Thank you so much for being here. Jeff Wheeler, regular attender. Um, thank you so much for being here. We've got Device Meister. Thanks so much for coming. We appreciate you. Um, we have an awesome episode today. If you were here last week, then you will know Kevin Fraser, whose name I pronounced incorrectly probably a dozen times last week, is to, here today to talk about uh, generative ambient music. That's the word that I used. I'm not even sure that that's what he calls it. But I can tell you this. He has created a, a situation for himself where in a relatively short period of time, he has mastered his use case. We'll see what he says if he feels he's mastered it. But he developed uh, a particular practice regiment, I'm going to dare to call it, that allowed him to go from being a brand new gig performer user, starting at square zero, to creating some really interesting soundscapes. Now, if you haven't heard of Kevin's work before, then I want you to check out that link in the description right now because we have his YouTube channel in there. Um, and there are quite a few live streamed pieces on there so you can kind of get some context. But I do know uh, after we chat with him today, um, you will certainly get it. You'll get it. It's very, very cool. So if you are here right now, since today is all about generative music, can you let us know in the comments, what is your favorite sequencer? Is your favorite sequencer a hardware sequencer? Is it a software sequencer? Do you use them at all? Um, I know for me, when I saw Kevin's setup, I was like, wow, I don't use any sequencing. Um, everything I do is totally triggered by some sort of a MIDI keyboard controller. Um, but Kevin's setup, everything is triggered by some sort um, of a sequencer. And I actually think there's, there's some powerful possibility um, in allowing yourself to create situations where sequencers can really generate something fantastic for you. Now, we're about to jump into Kevin being on stage. However, um, co-founder David Jameson is playing a show tonight. And he is uh, he's shared with us a link if you want to check it out. Um, there is a live stream that you can watch from anywhere in the world um, at the link in the description below. Now, there is a, a $5 viewing fee. Um, but I, David mentioned specifically that he has no control over that. Um, but if you want to see how he's using Gig Performer in this uh, band, this is his uh, Steely Dan tribute band, um, then you'll want to click that link, grab a ticket, check out what he's doing. Um, one of the reasons that Gig Performer works so well is that David is using Gig Performer. Um, and so things that come up or things that work not so well, he knows about because it has to work for him because he happens to also be a professional musician in addition uh, to being a ridiculously talented software developer. So make sure you check out that show. Um, don't jump away just yet, but do make sure at the end of this stream, you check out Kevin's YouTube channel uh, where he's creating all of this generative music. Um, and I'm sure he'll, he'll be willing to connect with you as well if you have any questions for him. So don't forget, let us know what you are using uh, as a sequencer. Um, OJ Lab watching live from Ghana. Thank you so much for being here. Welcome, Adam. So happy that you are here as well. All right. Without further ado, we are going to welcome Kevin Fraser onto Backstage with Gig Performer. Kevin, how's hey, it going? Hi. <laughs> uh, let, me, let me just, uh, I just wanted to make sure everybody understood that clearly before we, before we proceed. <laughs> um, Brett, first of all, I would like to thank you so much uh, and David for inviting me uh, to share, you know, what I've done here. It's uh, um, kind of humbling and I will share with you that the past week has been, I mean, I didn't tell, tell you about this in the pre-show, but the past week has been this insane meltdown of wow. unbelievable proportions for me. Wow. Um, my computer completely... You know, after we talked, I told you about my 1,500 yeah. successful Gig Squad calls. Yeah. My computer completely melted down. I'm talking about I couldn't install Windows on it. It wouldn't install Windows. Did you call but the Geek Squad? I did not because they would have called me. <laughs> but the good news is, the good news is um, I completely 
repaired absolutely everything. I'm talking bare metal. Wow. All of my VSTs reauthenticated. Nothing is lost. Everything came back 100%. I was about a two and a half terabyte backup. So, so all Kevin, the stuff that I've done, I think I'm going to put that into a PDF because other people might want to know about it. Sorry, yeah. go on. <laughs> well, no, there's, there's some hidden wisdom here. I know we're in and we're like coming on strong, but you must have a great system of backing your stuff up. I do. Yeah. There's, Can there's you... a bunch of things. There's actually really only two things that I use. Um, okay. um, tell, tell first of all, that. from personal, I mean, I'm not paid by them or anything, but I recommend Backblaze. It saved me. <laughs> okay. Great. Great. And that's, that's the primary way you back your stuff up. You, that's uh, no, I also use on windows. I use something called Macrium reflect. Okay. Great. Which I cannot recommend highly enough either because now I know how well it works. <laughs> In any case, if you are watching right now and you are not backing up your computer, um, Don't do it. <laughs> today's your day. Today's your day. You thought Watch we were going to later back your computer up now. <laughs> like, don't. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, so Kevin, you have had like, you've had an expansive career. You've been all over the map, right? Like who kind of sort of, yeah. yeah. Who are you, Kevin? Can you give us a brief introduction to um, your you, life? You, How did you end up here? Talk. You, 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 you may get a sense of this somehow, but um, <laughs> I, I have a background in performing, Brad. Yeah, I, um, you know what? Well, believe I it or not, when I was a kid, I mean, I'm talking about when I was a teenager, like a young teenager, I did community theater productions of retired Broadway musicals. Believe it or not, I played Tevye when I was 16, if you can believe that. <laughs> I, I, on the one oh, hand... Wow. <laughs> you know, I played on, but and then on the other hand, but then again, on the other hand, you know, nice Catholic boy from Winnipeg playing yes. this in the middle of a pogrom. Um, I did all kinds of Broadway musicals. I did plays. I played Matt and the Fantastics. I went to acting school. I did all that kind of stuff. And then I got into broadcasting mm -hmm. um, in radio, back when radio was still a thing. I was on the air in a couple of major markets in the big chair, as we say. Mm -hmm. um, and then I realized that I needed to feed my wife and stuff like that. So I wanted to Is she particularly department. hungry or was it just, um, <laughs> just radio? Painful. You know, it's not as glamorous as it looks. <laughs> That's the thing. Gotcha. You know, gotcha. It's, it's not as glamorous as it looks. And so I went into um, technical writing and I worked for. I, I worked in telephony, I worked in defense, I worked in test and measurement, I worked for a little outfit called Navtel for years, the technicians mm -hmm. are going to know that name forever. Mm -hmm. um, I wrote the first manual for a recording um, uh, uh, string, string, hardware string search uh, triggering uh, protocol analyzer, and I went on from there to a bunch of other adventures, including surviving a dot-com meltdown and spending a year in film school back in the 90s. <laughs> so I have been around the block, as as we say. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you, in, you're also an expert troubleshooter. I feel like that's relevant. I, I you know, you, you always wonder about that. <laughs> you always <laughs> wonder about that. I've been a software developer too, right? So you sure. always wonder about that. And you always think, um, you know, can I do this? Well, it turns out that I can. And I just proved it my, myself this week. You know, mm -hmm. I also, I didn't even tell you about this yet, but I also evaded a, a particular health scare this week. So I had oh, wow. quite a week, I got to tell you. Great. But, uh, but uh, when, when I, when I get, uh, when I, when I sat, when I got the, the, there's, there's this virus that everybody's, it's been all the papers you heard about. Yeah. It. There's been a virus. It's this virus. Everybody's talking about it. <laughs> okay. I got it for the third time back in well, April. Did McAfee and protect and you from that or that, was it? Um... <laughs> I, I realized that I I needed and probably other people needed some kind of uh, expression of healing of some sort, you know, yeah. like a, just in a sensory way, you know, healing. And so I I had gotten this program gig performer. Mm -hmm. um, I got it at the um, the Black Friday sale because I'm so cheap. I squeak when I walk, and um, <laughs> I uh, got this program set up, and I kind of played with it a little bit, and I tried a couple things out, and I got my controller working with it i have an akai mpk mini mark ii like you know a lot of probably millions of people have those things mm -hmm. and i started messing around with it a little bit i'm not a keyboardist i'm not i mean i've done music kind of sorta you know all these years but i'm i have this kind of mental block for instance about 
um, music theory. And I'm sure you're a teacher, aren't you, Brett? You're a piano yeah, teacher. I so am, you yeah, have yeah. lots of students. And <laughs> so I'm kind of this idiot savant sort of guy with, with music theory. Yeah, sure. I, I know just enough to be dangerous, you know? Yeah. And so I started playing around, or to think I'm dangerous, at least. <laughs> um, I started playing around with different tonalities, and I came up with this hack called minor pentatonic. Yeah. <laughs> so, it's it's a great hack. And so minor pentatonic plus transposing gives you mm -hmm. a lot of options that you didn't know were there before. So yeah. I started playing around with that, you know, throw in the odd white key for spice. You know, I, mm -hmm. I started playing around with that. And I found, and I decided that I wanted to learn the software. I not only wanted to learn the VSTs, the kind of ragtag collection of VSTs that I have that a lot of us have, right? If you play around with this sort of stuff. But I also wanted to learn how to put it together. And I had a couple of years ago built this really pretty um, uh, complex setup using Reaper, which, you know, I will say can function as a really capable VST mm -hmm. um, if you want to use it that way. But like a VST host, you mean? Like about it because it's a DAW, right? And mm -hmm. so you, you want to you wanna use a VST host. And that's why I got gig performers. So I decided, okay, how do you do this? How do, you, how do I simplify it? How do I break it down to the simplest? Because I tend to elaborate. Sure. I'm just sure. warning you. I tend to elaborate. <laughs> and how do I make this as simple as possible for me? And this is what came out. I started, I went, okay, what's the simplest thing I can do? And I just opened a blank gig performer document. And I thought, okay, I'm going to treat this like weightlifting or something, mm -hmm. right? I'm mm -hmm. just going to try a little more every day. Mm -hmm. And before I knew it, I was doing like one or two or three or four. Like, I think I even did four or five of them a week at one point for, mm -hmm. for a period of time. And after I sort of stayed with this, I wound up with like over, there's actually well over 50 hours and I live streamed all of it. I didn't make it and render it and upload it. I actually live streamed all of it because mm -hmm. I've got the gear here because I also in the middle of all that stuff I told you about before I live streamed on Twitch for five years. That's a whole other story. Right, video, and, video game live streaming, right? Is that yes? <laughs> That's a long story. Yeah, <laughs> and and I and I had never even looked at video games before I started doing that. Like you know, mm -hmm. I said it's a very strange story. Maybe another mm -hmm. time. Yeah, but sure. The, but the point is that I started building these. I call them generative ambient soundscapes because I don't really think they're music. Like I've done compositions and I studied film scoring in in the film school. Um as this kind of you know hidden musical illiterate you know i didn't really know what i was talking about quite mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but i found that i could come up with something that i was satisfied with that i was pleased with mm -hmm. and i also looked at the enormous market if you search on youtube for relaxation music which probably a lot of us and anybody watching this stream has done you find that there's thousands and thousands of videos some of them have gotten billions of views mm -hmm. over a long period of time like some of them have been there for like 13 years or something mm -hmm. and you you know you always want to kind of figure out a way to kind of tap into that whole idea of <clears throat> excuse me monetizing your content and so forth mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so this is what i focused on and i started doing these long 12 hour long um videos actually 11 minutes and hours and 55 minutes is the most that youtube will let you get away with mm -hmm. but i didn't i noticed that all of those other videos they were just shuffling a playlist mm -hmm. they had a set of pieces that they'd produced and um they basically fed that out through a playlist and they were looping and youtube actually has regulations now they've actually added regulations brett about uh in their terms of service that they refer to as uh looping and looping and uh it'll come to me i'm i'm pulling a senior moment here now That's that i'm right. in my 60s but looping content uh where they want to because there's an epidemic of this people of taking um i just saw one yesterday morning this video was kind of a joke the guy was saying um all you have to do is generate a, a hunk of white noise and audacity and uh, multiply that out with handbrake for 12 hours and upload it to youtube i'm right? like bah. there's right. there's videos that have zillions of views that have nothing but that <laughs> Right, so right, right. I wanted to come up with it had some kind of musical intelligence behind yeah. it, or something that could pass for musical intelligence. You know, mm -hmm. so that that's what I that's what I did. Yeah. So all all of this is so fascinating. So first of all, just to bring some context to what you're saying here, you had two goals, right? One was to learn the software, and two was to do it in a contextual way where you were building for something instead of just learning for the sake of learning. And yeah. I, I, this is key. And friends, those of you who have been watching every week, 
this w- amongst gig performer power users, the number one thing that unites them all is context. It's the number one thing. Everybody who's using gig performer really well on a high level doing interesting things is building for something for your YouTube channel, making generative music for a gig for whatever it is. So what's unique about your situation, Kevin, is that you created a project for yourself. You you created context for yourself. So for anyone who's watching, you can create context for yourself right now in this very moment, you can create context and it will, in my opinion, exponentially increase the rate at which you are learning because you'll have a purpose behind it. Um, and, uh, you know, Brett, let me add something uh, yeah. along that line. My youngest son is a multi-international award-winning jazz guitarist. Yes. And he's a teacher like you, you know, he's, he's a professional musician. Yeah. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I see with him and his friends, and I'm sure David can attest to this, is that when you're a professional musician, and this is what gig performer was designed for, was you professional working gigging musicians. We're going out to a paying audience like David's doing tonight. Yep. And yeah. you can't have anything go wrong at all, right? You've got to mm-hmm. play it safe and you've got to make sure that everything uh, goes to plan as rehearsed. Mm-hmm. I, if you, and especially if you are a professional and if you're trying to figure out how to use gig performer, give yourself permission to be an amateur yeah i I decided i'm going to be an amateur therefore i can get away with murder and that's what i did yep yeah absolutely it's like the 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 freedom to fail yeah absolutely couldn't agree with you more kevin so you created these pieces and it's not i i feel we left this part out but it wasn't just the music you created you also kind of created some visualizations to go with the music that you made eventually eventually that's okay. another part of it yeah i tried to simplify it as much as possible the only thing i worried about you see if you look at my earliest ones and a lot mm-hmm. of them like for you know like for a couple of months i paid no attention at all to the visuals i took a picture from nasa of two is the first uh image that came back from that new um observatory platform they put up uh of two colliding galaxies mm-hmm. <laughs> And I put that up and I just used that. And I put up this text. I think I said, welcome to the planetarium. Mm. And a funny thing happened when I was doing that, I eventually got a message from YouTube telling me Mm. that my videos didn't have enough motion in them. Ah, right. If you can believe that, like they know everything about what you're uploading to YouTube. So I got this video saying, you know, your videos don't have enough movement in them. So I said, okay, you want movement? You want movement? I'll give you movement. <laughs> so yeah. That's what I did. <laughs> yeah. Uh, which thankfully you, you have some experience in creating those types of things. Um, cause w- yes. when I saw your queen video, which I guess we'll talk about that project in a second here and looked at what was going on there. I was like, well, I don't know how to do that. Like, <laughs> like you watch that. An- okay. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. It's like another, um, it's another skill altogether. It's got, you know, kind of just in the realm of creating, it's like a thing that you, you know that you acquired somewhere. <laughs> you know, I'm 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 about to shift gears too. You know, in a way, like um, it's it's almost like this uh, six month run that I did, uh, sort of prepared me for the next step. You know, it's almost like you know I'm graduating and going on to the next step, right? And sure. so when I when I did my uh, uh, video tribute for Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, uh, I mean I do live in a Commonwealth country, so technically I do. You know, when when the day that happened, I had to say, you know, the Queen is dead. Long live the King. I mean, that's what we do here, right? Interesting. Constitutional okay. monarchy and all that. Um, but uh, I decided I wanted to do a tribute to this individual who, you know, is she's been the Queen for all of us, all of our lives. You know, and ninety nine percent of the time. And I came up with some some copy. And I, I went to make the music and um, I guess there was some element of inspiration there that I sort of, I feel like I sort of distilled everything down. Yeah. And I came, because I tried a lot of different approaches in using Gig Performer for all so, all sorts of different techniques. And I really went down some rabbit holes. You know, that's another thing about giving yourself permission to be an amateur and sort of be like unaccountable in a way. Like I, I went. I chased things down rabbit holes, Brett. Like I, mm-hmm. I went wacky with the MIDI controls and all kinds of things in a couple of places. And there were a number of them that actually exploded and I decided not to use them. You know, mm-hmm. I, I, I uploaded them and then I watched them and I didn't like how they sounded or I didn't like something else about it or something technical went wrong. So there were actually more than 50 mm-hmm, some mm-hmm. of them that I did. But the point I was trying to make about the, the, the video about Her Late Majesty was that I just, 
um, made much more use of the broadcast style setup that I've got here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So for and, those of you, and who as can't I said, stop. I'm shifting gears. I'm going to start integrating now. You know, because I've got a lot more potentials. You know, I've got one of these guys too. Yeah. Is that uh, the, uh, the and, stream deck? Yeah. And I'm mm -hmm. and I'm going to start. Um, and I also, you know, I've I've got. I've already done experiments with this and got the technical end of it working. I've, I'm sending OSC messages that are timed from the Windows Task Manager. You know, it's like cron mm -hmm. if you're if you're on a Mac or something like that. So, mm -hmm. I have like another semester coming <laughs> where yeah. I'm going to be ratcheting it up a bit more. Awesome. So let's let's pivot and have a look at what you're doing. Does now now feel like an okay time to kind of explain your process? Sure. And by yeah. the way, when you explain this process, I want everybody who is watching to remember that, Kevin, you started from scratch every day. Every day. I opened a blank <laughs> gig file with nothing in it at all. Mm -hmm. zippity doo -dah. Which in some um, ways is the least efficient and in some ways it, and it, is it the is most efficient. It is absolutely the least efficient. And I did it that way on purpose because it was the least efficient. Yes. I, yeah. I wanted to, like I said, like treating like weightlifting, I wanted to... Um, internalize that that process somehow do you feel um, that you've internalized I, it kevin say again do you feel that you've internalized it yeah i did i like i, I was i was going to say when i when i made this one i made this project just for this stream by the way the yes, one you're looking at now that. thank you yes a bunch of things kind of came together and distilled mm -hmm. and i realized that i may have a problem now i may have a syndrome i i i, I may have a blank gig file syndrome where I can't use Gig Performer unless I open it with a <laughs> blank file. Because I tried going back and looking at some of my own projects, you know, and yeah. it was like, oh, man. Yeah, remembering what you did is the challenge, this was right? so long ago, right? Yeah. And and so that's that's um, that's a new problem to deal with. But <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like you have to leave yourself breadcrumbs, which, like, you don't use the front panels at all, I assume, right? Oh, I do, yeah. Oh, you do? Okay, yeah. great. Um, like, I mean, that's that's part of the whole thing that I went down. In fact, in this case, let me just uh, let me just get a little more into this one. Um, in this case, I'm actually using um, this is the global, okay? Global rack space. Yeah, for the global rack space, as you can see now, um, in in the panels. What I've is done it? here is, um, I mean, I went through a phase where I used the panels to control like levels of synths and things like that for achieving a mix. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But then I realized that with Gig Performer, you know, you can control literally anything. I mean, if there's if there's a way to control it in a synth, then you can map it out to um, a, a controller, a keyboard controller, or you can get that data that's just data. It's just MIDI data coming from somewhere. It can be coming from a MIDI file, like I told you last week. Mm -hmm. I even tried making MIDI files that contain nothing but, you know, LFO expressions of uh, of uh, CC changes and stuff like that, because oh. in this type of music, you want to yeah. get these long scale changes happening. Mm -hmm. um, so and and so the the theory here now is that I want to create like an instrument, a total instrument, because I'm working in the box. Mm -hmm. And instead of worrying about this hardware device and that hardware device and so forth, I mean, I do have one controller, but it's just one of those little ninety nine dollar Akai controllers. Yeah. Um, what I what I want to do is come up with a much more meaningful, powerful kind of control. Yeah. So, for instance, um, these two. Okay. So, let me just run this one. So this has got a contact stack that I built yesterday, and I can go into how I put that one together and how I control it. But if I want to add a little bit of um, excitement to it, now this is this is a case of adding one of. This is a case of adding one of these little controls. So this one here is just a level. Can't reach it. Hmm. And I've scaled it there. I, you know, David will be able to recognize that so that I, I'm not going to be likely to overdrive. Even if I crank it all the way up, you know, there's a little bit of headroom left over there so that I'm not going to break anything down necessarily. Mm -hmm. But these other two, what's happening with them is something completely different. I've mapped these to CC14 and CC15 in this case. And I think you're going to like this one, Brett, because this is actually kind of a utility thing. 
So okay. instead of just controlling levels, I'm controlling something quite meaningful uh, in the overall um, rig. So let me go in there now and show you. What I've done here is um, I've mapped in, okay, now a lot of people aren't aware of how this little sequencer works in uh, contact play instruments. I'm sure you are, Brett, but um, these knobs, of course, can all be automated, mm -hmm. um, as you can tell. And so what I do here, and this is kind of a utility thing, um, I'm using another sequencer. I have to go into the Gazintas and the Gazoutas here, yeah. uh, called Stokas. And Stokas is, I found it really accessible and easy to work with. This this gives you a a um, you know this grid interface here, yes. Um, and this particular sequencer can you know Andrew uh, open source this. This is a free sequencer too, by the way. It's mm. from it's from uh, the people who make the Surge synthesizer. Are you familiar with Surge? Um, I am. Yes. Okay, so it's the same people. Uh, okay. This this is called Stokas, and Stokas gives you actually a lot of really powerful controls uh, for messing around with how the notes happen. Yes. And um, what I've done here is I've picked out a key. So I'm, I decided to go in C-sharp Dorian. Unfortunately, they don't, I don't have controls yet for, for these to automate. You have to set these manually. But okay. there are four layers. I've assigned them to four different MIDI channels. And I've set all of these keys to C-sharp Dorian. Okay, so that's kind of, you know, boring utility stuff. But to speed this up and to make it sort of um, a bit more easy to deal with, um, I've come up with these two knobs here, which I'm mapping to CC 14 and 15. And then in my contact stack, I'm using CC 14 and 15 and mapping to four different instances here on the, on the, uh, no, sorry, not the balance, the root and the scale. Gotcha. So by doing that to all four of them in a row, uh, because I ran into this problem where I would forget to set one of them. <laughs> Sure. You'd have them in two different keys, which is bad McGumbo. So yeah. by by setting by setting these up, um, as long as you don't silence you, can you see that the root key is changing from C to C sharp there? Um, I can cannot. Can you point that okay. out with your mouse? So the <clears throat> the root key knob is this one here. Okay. And each of these instruments has a root key knob mm -hmm. next to a scale knob. So that's where you're defining the root key and the scale that you want. Gotcha. Gotcha. So but this little utility step here of just you can see that little knob turning around there. Mm -hmm. Yep. What that's what that's doing is changing not just this one instance. I'm gonna frog in my throat. Not this just just this one instance, but all of them that I'm using because I've mapped them all through CC14 and 15 here. And this is one of those. It, it's a little more tricky than that because I found out that the only way I could get this to work was to pick up those uh changes and i was turning i was changing those with these knobs you'd ask me about the knobs and yes. uh so when i turn the knobs this is the data that's coming out um but that's changing um it's having the effect of changing um all of the contact stack settings for root key and scale at the same time so it's a time saver and it's an error preventer it's it's really interesting that you're taking that approach because generally speaking, I would greatly encourage people to not do what you are doing. <laughs> <laughs> well, literally, okay. Literally, but in this case, because it prevents you from having to go through and do every single thing manually, this is actually the most efficient route. Exactly. And that's, Which... that's another part of this whole thing of um, doing this workout every day yeah. is that you find opportunities for um, uh, uh, saving yourself from uh making mistakes or missing things on the check boxes right yeah yeah and uh this is one of those things because there were many times many times i started this came out of me getting frustrated by oh no i forgot to set the right key again mm -hmm. and the only limitation of this method is that they all have to be uh they can none of them can be soloed right so so if you solo any of them and then you change it it won't change the ones that are muted gotcha. so as long as you're as long as you're not soloed on all of them um, and you sort of get used to just tweaking this and just making sure that you've got them all lined up so that you don't run in, into it. Because yeah, there were yeah. lots of times that I did this, Brett, where um, <laughs> I got the thing running and then I thought, something doesn't sound right and I'm completely musically illiterate. Mm. What have I done? Sure. And then I would go in there and find out, 
oh, well, it turns out if you have one of your contact instruments playing in the sequencer in um, uh, uh, a, a Locrian when the rest of them are Lydian, <laughs> Mm -hmm. you're gonna have, you have a problem results probably yeah okay. yeah so so this is like the the start i guess of your process is kind of choosing sounds would, would you say like you kind of get a like yes a and that's another thing that fell out of my sort of design that i came up with here is that yeah um i can compartmentalize um the composing and the performance aspect of the piece yeah um by by being able to um with my within the context of my musical illiteracy um by having um the the music separated out and i only came up with this idea like last night actually so mm -hmm. you're sort of watching this growing on the vine here but yeah. by separating out uh these four layers in stokas uh -huh. um, I'm picking up notes the way that I want to, so I can set it to a, a mono or a poly probability mode. I can set the maximum number of poly here. This isn't really going to be about this VST, right? That's not what the stream is about. True. But this allows me to, I call it note selection. I don't know if that's a thing or not, but this, this is what I started calling it. Uh, yeah. Note selection. So I want to, to hack music theory to make sure that I'm going to select notes that don't sound like something you want to throw into a dumpster fire. Sure. And, and once once I have once I have that coming out, and I've got my uh, contact stack, I'm I'm actually using Blue Cat Connector because um, it was the best and most reliable and flexible way I could find to get MIDI um, from global into uh, local uh, and so we forth. A, especially when you start when building doing. out, especially when you start building out more rigs. Now, the advantage of doing the way that I'm doing here, and you can see this already, Brett, but someone watching might not necessarily spot this. This allows me to compartmentalize the composition aspect of it and the sound design aspect ah. of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I have, you know, the musicians, okay, we think about it that way. I have the musicians off in the studio and they're all playing their longs and their shorts and their articulations and whatever and the conductor is waving his arms over the head the notes are coming in mm -hmm. <clears throat> and now i get to take the midi notes that i'm getting and decide what each of those channels that i have set out is going to sound like right and that gets into the realm of fun <laughs> yeah okay? so you start having a lot more fun yeah. and especially in this particular genre of music i mean if you're classic rock cover group something like that i really recommend that you give that a break hmm. you know because they've been playing those songs for a half a century now brad <laughs> and it's and true seriously and so if you kind of and they it goes around in your head right and you know they say what we used to say in the broadcast is we said the baby boomer generation ruined radio with the classic rock right um if, if <laughs> sure. you give that a break give yourself a break and step out of it and it's like it's like going on a vacation or something you can just kind of go down to the beach and you don't have to worry about meeting some kind of expectation and just see what you can come up with playing with sounds yeah and it has a lot to do with playing mm. you know i i think that i <laughs> i think that just a, you know a personal problem i have is that i have trouble playing mm. You know, it's like, a, it's a weird thing, but I, I'm always trying to justify everything, right? And I suppose mm. a lot of us do that, right? Mm -hmm. um, but if you can, if you can really purify the approach you're taking to this, uh, you get to boil it down and and take advantage of, you know, look at these pretty graphics and everything, right? Like this, mm -hmm. this gives you the opportunity to kind of play with everything and come up with sounds that are, you know, different from the patches they give you. Like a lot of people use these synthesizers and samplers just as, patch browsers right mm -hmm. but if you you know you know another thing that I'm, I'm doing here and i didn't get into that yet is playing with the in contact particularly now there's lots of synthesizers i've used i'm just using contact here because i wanted to come up with something that was low cpu and i didn't want it to be uh giving you a blurry picture which i mm -hmm. guess didn't work well it's coming <laughs> back now i think it may be in the internet i'm not really sure um okay. you, you said something there though like about contact being just really great on resources um, oh yeah oh yeah and, it's fantastic and you're not limited right like if you're you know you're watching and you're doing you know whatever style of music you're doing you can certainly sample any synth and bring it into contact as a sample 
oh, yeah. need to save CPU. So Contact does have a bunch of different um, options for you. Like, you know, you you're there's is it what is it called the create or the play series that's free yes free? you you with contact okay now i'm not a contact salesman but i know about <laughs> SoundWise, and i know that you know you guys have some kind of connection there but contact is i mean everybody knows right contact is a fantastic uh instrument mm -hmm. but one of the things that i really found valuable to me is that with contact um part of what you're getting with these contact instruments and even the free ones the contact play instruments the yeah. ones that you get with um, um, Total Control, which is you know free download for anybody, mm -hmm. um, is the design of the sampled instruments. Okay, a lot of people, you know, they they go to a lot of trouble uh, to record these samples, and you uh, you know the contact instrument, the contact play instrument, you always have two samples, right? You've got an A mm -hmm. sample and a B sample, and there's a balance control down here, and the balance control is not to be confused with the pan control, the left and right, which is up here. Mm -hmm. uh, which I've also automated and play with. Mm -hmm. But the point here is the balance control is deciding how much of this sample and how much of this sample are involved in the resulting um, output. And yeah. using the same technique that I did for um, controlling the sequencers uh, root key and scale here with, I, in this case, I use CC 14 and 15. You can use any CC you want, it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. um, I used uh, this run of blanks here uh, 21 through 24. Oh, and I'll tell you another another tip here. Uh, I always do this. I can never remember what all the CCs are. Mm -hmm. So what I do is I just pull up a MIDI filter, and I found that the list that you guys have in here is pretty comprehensive. Oh, sure. Um, and I use this as a cheat card. <laughs> a lot of okay. times. If I'm deciding, you know, what CC do I want to use? Well, I don't want to run the risk of, of running into some synthesizer that has implemented um you know modulation wheel fine or uh you know expression fine uh, you know so i'll just use this to to go through and figure out you know which which where's where's a blank a pass through that i can use mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so that's one of my little um, operational tricks but going back to this balance control what i've done here is i've um i've added this uh, in this case i'm using cc 21 through 24 and I've mapped those through the balance control on each of these contact instruments. So what that lets me do is in this case, and now this gets into using, um, I actually use Device Meister for this, uh, Device Meister Stepic, and Jens is, is here. Mm -hmm. Thank you, this Jens, for being really, here. I really love this, uh, this sequencer as well. I mean, I have a bunch of sequencers, but this one has really worked out well for me. And one of the things I like about it is that it has this automation tab. And so the automation tab runs independently of the main sequencer. Uh, and I'm using that for something else I'll explain in a minute. But the, the automation tab is, uh, in this case, I've got it set up. There's a lot of different ways you can set this up. <laughs> but it's very powerful. <clears throat> but what I've got to do is, uh, what I'm doing is, is selecting a value to go to. In this case, this says 25. So this is the 25 that I'm using. Um, this this one is called 25. So what I'm doing there is I'm sending, as it plays, it's sending a value that changes this balance control. And what that's doing is altering um, how much of this sample, the A sample and the B sample are being involved at any moment. And so by doing that, you know, just infrequently, yeah, um, every once in a while, it's going to have the effect of giving me almost like different instruments playing. Yes. Um, but in a really curated way so that i'm not just like it's not like krell music where i'm just playing a random frequency mm -hmm. um I'm, I'm what i'm doing is actually taking advantage of the taste and the um engineering prowess and the production prowess of the guys who designed these sounds of yep. the sound designers so it's like i'm a kid who's being put into a really huge playpen you know i i can i can go and play with anything i want to in there and i'm not going to get hurt you know, put it that way. I've got two grandchildren now, so you have to start thinking that way. <laughs> well, the other thing too, Kev, that you're kind of jumping around here is that like those knobs at the bottom are not an accident. Absolutely not an accident. And that, <laughs> that plays right into what I'm talking about. Yeah. By focusing, you know, there's so many controls. I mean, if you look at the, um, the host automation parameters, okay, uh, here, look at this list. This is, this is coming from contact, okay? Yep. Every yep. single one of these things that I'm scrolling down through here, you can automate um, using host automation, which is a different method from, from MIDI CC. Yep, yep. Um, 
but but what but and what that do, what those talk to is it talks to every one of the controls on every one of these panels in here so you have you know you have absolute control but the the genius of the this contact play series the instrument is that this bottom row here which is the same on all of them okay mm -hmm. well, these are instruments that come from contact and there's a lot of other developers who adopt the same design philosophy for making these arturia has a very similar I mean, they all do really, but yeah, go, go on, Kevin. But, but what I'm getting at the, you know, the payload here is that these knobs along the bottom here are really, really powerful sound design tools that one of the things I love about these, um, the sound design in contact is that, um, these knobs are very meaningful and they're not just randomly selected. They're not just going, oh, we got to fill up six different knobs there. These actually are a big deal. And if you work this bottom row here and you start playing with this bottom row, you're gonna be able to get customized variations of the sounds that are coming out. Yes. Um, that that will, still will when you start using accurate. other instruments, it will combine with other instruments. And one of the things that I was really pleased with in this experiment that I've done um, is that um, I, I came up with, you know, in sitting and actually listening to it, which you have to do, yeah. <laughs> you got to eat your own dog food, right? So yeah. in sitting and listening to it, I would notice that it was actually, you know, without being self-serving, it was actually compelling. Like I could actually sit and listen to it and put it on and, you know, I'd be scrolling on my phone or something like that or, mm -hmm. or reading a book or something. And then I would notice and go, that's like, there's strings happening in there and there's horns happening in there and there's, you know, some kind of synthesizer happening in there. And I kind of ran out of time here and I didn't add another really beefy like bass synth, which I yeah. usually do too. Yeah. But you know, your, your, your bass synth is happening in there. And so, uh, and here's another aspect of, of the whole overall design thing is that using contact, um, I will, I will end up with the sampled uh, aspects of it, but I will also generally, I will also add, um, an analog emulation of a synthesizer. Like I've been using a lot of the cherry audio ones lately. Yes. Oh, they yeah. have another cherry audio has a new synth dropping today too. It's an original synth. It's not an emulation. Very interesting. I can't remember the name of it. Um, I bet seen we can find it. but, um, but, uh, it's, it's apparently it's their own design. So it's Is like it a total Elka, Elka X. No, Elka was the one that came out a couple of weeks ago, and that's a um, uh, it's an, an emulation. emulation. It's an extremely rare Italian synthesizer. Really interesting story behind yeah. it too, for somebody who worked in electronics manufacturing. But um, but the point is, I will I will use one of these synthesizers uh, for bass. And the other thing about using, I love the global uh, rack space because this is where I do all of my processing and mastering, and I haven't gone into that whole thing, but. Um, another aspect of doing this live because I didn't pre-render these in a digital audio workstation and upload them. Mm -hmm. um, I did them all live, which means that you have to take people's eardrums into account. <laughs> so, sure. yep. um, you have to use limiters and you have to use compression and stuff like that. Um, and, the, and, and I can come up with a, a, a way of doing the processing. And this is another aspect that changed every time I open a new blank gig file was that I would experiment with, different processing chains for producing my final, you know, minus 14.4 lofts targeting and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. If you're, if you go down that far into those rat holes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, so you're, you're doing all of this in real time, some contact, some synthesizers, and then before it hits YouTube, you're making sure everything is at the same level. Yes. Well, I'm, I mean, I'm doing loudness targeting. So what, I, what I'll do is I'll, I'll go and um, I'll use something like th this one, just because I know everybody knows this one, I think I'll use Yulene. Okay. Um, but I don't recommend leaving the free version running because it's, it's got some problems. It'll crash. The, like, free, the, th the free version you said? Yeah, I don't. I don't know this. I've I've tried using the the free version, but I have had it uh, be the cause of a crash. So I wouldn't. I mean, I would okay. use it for checking on things, but I wouldn't leave it on leave a, it. a production one that I was going to do live. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, but it's very easy to understand and easy to read. That's why I, yes. I recommended it. Absolutely. So just for like clarity, you know, we talk a lot about on the stream, you know, using 
um, you know, avoiding standardized CC messages. Because avoiding we, standardized. Like uh, avoiding being like, I'm going to send CC 11 to control expression or send CC whatever. Um, because in the context of using a keyboard on a stage or using, you know, a MIDI instrument of any type, um, there's a possibility that you may accidentally send a message. But in your context, that's not going to happen. Because, right? Yeah. <laughs> because your, your, all of your CC messages, if you're like listening and you're trying to piece this together, all of the CC messages you're sending, you're sending on purpose from one of your sequencers. Absolutely. So you're, not, you're not just sequencing notes, you're also sequencing controls. So there's, because of the just format of it, there's no chance of any accident happening. And so doing it in this, I, 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 unless the accident started in here, <laughs> fair, fair. Yeah. So in, you know, there's, there's some of the precautions that we take as instrumentalists are a little bit different than you would take as a sequencer. Yeah. I, I, I see. I took all the safeties off. Right. So yeah. I, I don't well, have to worry about a paying audience. And that's why, you know, I would actually recommend yeah, I've been thinking about this. I would actually recommend it. Like if you're sort of in the same kind of space as me, and there probably are a lot of people yeah. who have some interest in synthesizers, they've got some collection of VSTs, they kind of sort of played with it, maybe make some cover songs and stuff like that. So that's what we all sort of do when we start out. Um, I would say pull the trigger and buy the license. You know, <laughs> here I put sure. my salesman hat on. Pull, <laughs> pull the trigger and buy the license for Gig Performer. Because first of all, it's not the biggest cliff you've jumped off in the last month, you know, yep. uh, you can afford it. It's, yeah, it's a little more expensive, but it's it's not that expensive. I mean, if you added up everything else that you spent on your setup, especially if you've got advanced stage gear acquisition syndrome, like a lot of people do, right? I managed to <laughs> evade, I've, I've soft gear acquisition syndrome. That's that's my problem. But the, the point is if you, if you get, if you give yourself this playground, okay? So I, I think of gig performer as a playground where I can just fool around with anything I want to. You have to apply some kind of a discipline, right? Mm -hmm. Like I took my two-year-old granddaughter out to the slide for the first time and she had to learn how to walk up to the top and go over yeah. to the edge and then get her courage up and go down the slide, right? Yeah. But now that's her favorite video of all time to watch on my phone when she comes to visit me, right? Because yeah. that's the moment where you make the thing happen, right? Yes. And I would say, get gig performance, just get it. Yeah. Even if you get it and it, you know, you don't do much with it and, you know, maybe you just set it up to control some things with the VSTs with your controller. That's fine. That's fine. At some point, you're going to be able to go into the deep end of the pool. And when you do that, don't be afraid of it. Don't approach it as, oh, no. Like, I think there's a fear factor when you're, yeah. especially if you're a live musician. Okay. Now, you you are out there every Sunday morning, right, Brett? It's true. You're it's out true. there. I've been there. I've been <laughs> conducting the choir on Sunday morning and you can't mess around with that, right? You've got to, you can't, you have to color inside the lines. But uh, when you're using, when you're using Gig Performer as kind of a sonic playground, it's actually not that expensive and it runs like a tank. The thing is a tank. You cannot break this program. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, having said that, sure, I've had crashes, mm -hmm. but that wasn't Gig Performer's fault. Yeah, that was, sure. it's never gig performer's fault. That's because of something that that went wrong in a VST. You know, you got some VSTs that won't allow you to run more than one instance, or they get twitchy, or whatever happens. Right? It's a program. Once you give the VST control, it's a program. It can do whatever it wants to, and if it crashes, that could take gig performer down. But that's not gig performer's fault, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. Well, you know, so it, it is like the reliability thing is just super paramount. Um, yeah. But then there's also the testing thing which is also paramount, right? Like the repetitions of making sure that something is is solid and stable and learning. And, and that process, like especially the way that the kind of obsessive compulsive lunatic way that I approach this starting in <laughs> April, the process has given me a lot of learning opportunities. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I've learned a tremendous amount about VSTs, uh, particular synthesizers, um, you know, uh, the the whole aspect of mastering the music and getting it to 
the loudness target you want without going too loud and all this kind of stuff. And I will, you know, I'm one of those people actually go and turn on the, the stats for geeks thing in YouTube to see if they turned me down as much as they turned down Bruno Mars, you know, stuff like that. So, <laughs> so, uh, I, you know, the, the thing is, the thing is that gig performer gives you, it puts all of the tools on the table. It's like walking into a, you know, if you like woodworking, it's like walking into a woodworking shot that is completely equipped, lined wall to wall with every conceivable tool and attachment and it, it, everything. If you don't see it, there's a way to make it happen anyway. You just didn't notice it yet. Yeah, yeah, yep, absolutely. So um, I wanna, first of all, if anybody has questions for Kevin, please post them. Jeff Wheeler says, jamming over my own soundscape creations is my new phase after years of songs and copies with gig performers. Awesome flexibility. My sound palette is limitless and I'm loving it. Yeah, so, so, so yeah. Jeff is a, new, is, a, is a believer too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I would love to hear this. I, actually, one thing I wanted to point out. So first of all, if you have any questions uh, for Kevin, let's put them in the comments. Second of all, uh, Kevin, he, this is a pro tip for you, but also actually for everybody, really. Hey, so I told you I'm an amateur. I can spend... get away with murder. <laughs> well, you know, okay, this is another thing too, right? Like, we are here because we care about the process of creation. But the audience that consumes your music doesn't care. They're two different audiences. And so, like, uh, to anybody who's That's going... That's why I haven't done how-tos yet. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, let's we're ready for it, by the way. But the 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 thing I'm getting at here is that like as as performers who are making art, what people care about who are receiving our art is what is created, not how it is made. So if you have a tool that works for you and you're getting the output that you want, then who cares how you're using it, right? Like because <laughs> because you're getting this output, and that's like the primary thing people interact with, which I just think is important. Um, second of all. Nemanja just wrote a blog about using MIDI files to control rack space switching. Now, you're not doing that, but what you are oh, doing yes, is... Oh, yes, I am, Brad. Oh, oh, yes, I am. Oh, there you go. Are you using Blue Cat to get your CCs back in? I am, yeah. I'm actually, yeah. I'm, I'm using uh, Blue Cat to get every, all of my MIDI is coming in through Blue Cat. So, so, so I wanted to make this... I, I wanted to be able to create for you, and David today, Brett, this shockingly simple layout <laughs> shockingly simple layout yeah but uh, beautiful beautifully laid out that that actually doesn't even need these ah, pff, gone don't need those um <laughs> the midi file player this is my own um special invention which i'm sure other people have invented um i just made it this is an example of all the different crazy ways that i've tried to get midi into uh gig performer into my vsts this is a custom midi file that i created yesterday afternoon in reaper uh just the only thing this midi file does you because of reaper you have to put one midi event in there so it's like a c minus two with the velocity turned down to zero at the very end of it so that i can export the midi file but what this does is it varies the tempo over a period of time mm -hmm. very slightly and um you know, that's sort of like anathema to a lot of people, but you'll notice it says 118 here. I'm using the default 120. That's another thing. You don't have to use 20 beats per minute to make this type of music. That, mm -hmm. That's something that I learned along the way, and you shouldn't because it gives you a lot more options if you leave it at 120 because of the uh, resolution that you get. Yeah. Um, but if I, if I start playing this, notice what's happening to the... Um, it's happening very slowly, but 118.2 beats per minute. Mm -hmm. It's going to change 118.3. Okay. So what's happening is I've got a couple of like linear changes happening in here that will just vary the tempo of the piece a little bit over time. Why would you do that, Kevin? That's like anathema to a lot of people, especially myself. Like I used to DJ dances when I was a teenager and I was in radio and stuff like that. Everything had to be mm -hmm. 120 beats per minute. Um, one of the things we found out back in radio is that um men have a tendency to prefer constant beats per minute hmm. women like to hear a variation even a slight variation interesting so i'm trying to address that a little bit but there's a technical reason that i do this too in this case and this works with a lot of vsts um i'm using this uh, tape echo now anybody who's been in a recording studio sometime in the last half a century has probably seen one of these in the corner 
Mm-hmm. Um, this this is a very famous uh, Roland uh, tape echo, uh, which is uh, emulated masterfully by I think by uh, Cherry Audio. And I don't have I'm not a salesman for Cherry Audio, mm-hmm. but um, <clears throat> by by changing the tempo, this is going to have effects on this tape echo. And I found that it will actually produce a whole new class of different kinds of artifacts and sounds because the tape echo is hanging on to the pitch of what's going into it. And by changing the tempo, the samples and the rate or something with the something and the something, you end up with these whole different kinds of sounds that will emerge from your existing reverb and and uh, delay uh, plugins mm-hmm. automatically. So yep. that's just a nice little hack. Now, this particular MIDI file, and I'm guessing that what that that what has been identified in there is that you you can put you can put 127 curves in your MIDI file that are changing all the time. And mm-hmm. I've also done uh, Brett. I've even created these custom reactor packages that I made to produce you know LFO change frequencies as expressed as CCs mm. to very different controls. On like I've done some really wacky stuff. Interesting. And, just gone to places that I didn't even think I was going to be going with this stuff, but that goes along with the whole playing around thing. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Um, so, so much as possible sending messages in like this. If you need a local way to get MIDI CC back into Gig Performer, there is a mini script in the blog that was just done that okay. will send it back into the local GP port. Okay. And then you can use a MIDI in block from the local GP port to send it. Anyway, what you're okay, doing. Because, thanks, thanks for the tip. I will go and look that up. And by the way, I'm going to do the commercial for you, Brett. Tell me. The support eh? that you get in in the, uh, the the discourse. And this is not set up. We didn't set that, this up in advance. We didn't even mention this before. <laughs> but the support that you get in the gig performer discourse is totally worth the price of admission if you're buying a copy of, of gig performer. There, there are people in there have been using this program for as long as it's been around, like, what is it, seven, eight, nine years or something since this, I think it's 2015, 2012? is it? 2012? 2012, something like that, since Gig Performer has been in existence. And if you go in there and put the simplest total beginner question, you know, dummy mode enabled, um, you're going to get these really friendly, kindly people pointing you to exactly the information that you need and they will bend over people i have seen people in there writing scripts for other people to do custom things like really yeah. complicated scripts that do really complicated things yes so um so i and i this is really remarkable the, the discourse support for gig performers off the scale like you pay your 167 bucks what is it the, the list price for the program you get all getting all that support too and i have not seen support like that i mean i i name and names but i sent around a lot of emails this week to a lot of vst developers who didn't even respond to my email like not yeah. you, you know even even as a, even as a as a customer as a tech support message haven't even responded to me yet yes. but if yeah. you drop a note into the discourse for your gig reformer you are most li- the first response that i got when i put this thread in there about my little journey here was from david yeah Yep. Uh, and it, his response was one word. Wow. Two exclamation points, which kind of blew me away. <laughs> right. Yeah. But, but, but the point is it um, um, scripting, you know, I mentioned that I was trying to simplify things as much as possible. Well, scripting, I have a background in software yes. development. So I wanted to keep, um, yeah, keep my, 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 my blinders on. So scripting is going to be like the next level for me. I'm going to start getting into scripting now. So thanks for that tip. I'll go and look that one up, Brett. For sure. I mean, it's even more for people who don't have a solution. But um, this script, by the way, is one line and it's copy paste. So if you don't want to learn scripting, you can stay away from it. I know I can tempt you down the rabbit hole of scripting. Um, Okay. So uh, if if you're not also, if you're not into programming, if that's not something you've done in the background, you have to remember that, I mean, we have some hardcore software developers watching this today too. But if you're a musician and you're kind of scared, you know, of programming, scripting is easy mode programming. It's put, also put not it needed way. in Gig Performer. It's totally not needed. Yeah. All the stuff that I've done here has been without any scripting of any kind. No, zero scripting. Yep. Um, Glenn wants to know if you plan to share any of your rack files. 
there's a space in the forum that would work just fine. Kevin, can you play us your sequenced song? Sure. How many hours you want? <laughs> it um, is generative. It is generative. Well, can you give us a three minute version? Sure. All right. And that's the other thing. Um, you know, another aspect about this was that uh, with my five years of this, real quick, yeah. five years of streaming on Twitch, um, interaction with the chat, as you know, Brett, is very important. Yeah. And um, I tried doing that playing a game, very distracting to try yeah. to talk to uh, 40 people or watching you play a game at the same time that you're kind of, you know, I, yeah. I, actually, I went out and bought one of these things, you know, I never had one of these in my life before. Yeah. Um, but, um, and I was actually, I wasn't really actually playing the game. There was someone else who knew how to play it. It was operating me like a meat puppet from remote control. But um, the, the, uh, the, the, the musical result here. So this particular piece, I called it All Hallows. All Hallows, I love it. Because musically, when I was deciding, like I didn't go into the whole thing there, but the the, the tonality of it, you know, the, the note selection, I call it, um, I wanted to reference All Hallows Eve, which everybody's getting all excited about at this time of the year. And uh, Halloween, of course, is the exact opposite of what All Hallows Eve actually means. <laughs> all Hallows yep. Eve is the Feast of All Saints, so it's like the opposite. So I called it All Hallows. And it's not scary, but it's got kind of moodiness. I did it in Dorian. I'm I'm learning about the emotional reactions of these. Uh, yes, and these and modes. there's what, what's cool about this, Kevin, is that like you know, it's not nothing is random, <laughs> even though yeah. there's some randomness. But you're it's like intentional, uh, intentionally built. Um, I just have to make sure. That I didn't knock myself. Uh, no, I didn't. Okay. I didn't knock myself into the wrong key. But that's another thing. And I didn't go into this. Once you have all this set up and it turns into sound design, guess what, Brett? You can start replicating the you can start replicating the rack spaces. Yeah. And because I'm doing my note selection and uh, CC control in the global rack space, if I switch from one rack space to another, even if I'm using a different tempo. Ah, even if I'm using yep. a different tempo, that smooth fading from one rack space to another. I didn't multiply this out here today, but th mm -hmm. that all works too. And you can get completely different sound design for all the rack spaces that you have. So, yes. Yes. If you don't have gig performer, do yourself a favor, get it today. What can I say? <laughs> I love it. I love it. I'm going to put you full screen on and maybe you can, you can even narrate it if you want. Sure. Just explain what's happening so we can kind of get the vibe and... We'll have a sure. listen. So my um so when I came up with these graphics, see maybe I'll play with the graphics while I'm at it here too. Um all this stuff is happening in real time too, by the way, Brad. Yes. Now there's one of the downsides, that loud note that just happened there. You have to this one isn't very well developed. I just made it yesterday. Sure. And you get surprises. Mm -hmm. Like I did not realize that I was going to get this kind of plodding sort of um, like little kids walking around outside on the 31st of October in their little costumes, you know, the, the Dorian door -door would do that for candy you. and stuff like that, right? It's a little, little bit of a teddy bear's picnic or something happening. But the other thing is that if you listen, as time goes on, you also, I, sometimes I will also get these, uh, so, take that away. I will get these uh, silent spots that happen and that's part of it as well. You know, I have to deal with how I'm triggering notes. And mm -hmm. you can see there, that's, I didn't do anything. All I did was hit the play button a minute ago. Mm -hmm. yep. And now because of the changes that I have going to the balance controls in the contact stack that I'm using, and I'm only using one contact stack and it's only got four contact instruments in it. Mm -hmm. it. That balance control really multiplies the options and the possibilities and the sounds that you get. And that's only the balance control. There's yeah. all of those other controls on the bottom of the contact uh, instruments. For each instrument, these controls along here, work that bottom row. Mm -hmm. um, and another pro tip, if you, this uh, little dice thing up here, if you've never looked at that before, the little dice thing mm -hmm. on the bottom right of all the instruments, if you hold down the shift key and click it, if you hold down, if you click it by itself, it completely randomizes the whole sound. Mm -hmm. But if you hold down just the shift key and click it, it randomizes 
just these controls here. Yeah. So you end up with a sound that is kind of following the rules, like it's sort of curated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, another thing that's just, you know, actually missing from this particular piece is that I never got into, I never got to the stage of adding a bass synth. Mm -hmm. And in fact, when I do that, I will actually add more stuff to the processing here. Sometimes I'll add a, a bass emphasis, you know, or, uh, you know, something like a, a Waves Max bass or something like that so that I can really have a lot more control over the bass end of it. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to get some excitement factor in here. So that's why I included... Yeah. Because all the little Halloweeners on the streets there, they can all start dancing. That's right. I love it. And also, if you know, if you have your bass and drums playing and stuff like that. If the stochastic stuff results in silence for a moment, instead of it just being the movement in between two, you know, the silence in between two movements of an orchestra, you can have this continuity happening between them. Yeah. And by having all of this, the robots playing the music like this. My vision was that that would give me the ability to interact with chat, but mm. I don't have any viewers yet. <laughs> so, <laughs> are you going to live stream this? This particular this one? Your channel? I was thinking, you know, I could actually live stream it. Yeah. Yeah. Are um, you going to do that I, now I or later? Put it on. Yeah. Are you Are you planning to do that like right after the stream, or are you going to tweak it first? Uh, I could I could do it later today. I, I'd have to switch switch a couple of cables around to, to be able to do the streamyard thing, but I could I could do it later today. Yeah. Um, tell you what, if you get if you if you send an email, um, if you send an email to my um, to my um, the gray is cool the gray is cool at gmail dot com. I'll push a message out to tell you when I put it live. That's, is that is what's on the screen is, right now? That is correct. You are correct, sir. Bonus Fantastic. points if you get that reference to 20th century television comedy. Um, Didn't. Kevin, thanks so much for being with us. Brett, thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you for your kindness and especially yeah. the whole hour you spent with last week just getting to know each other. We did another call, you know, yeah. before, you know, just so we could horse around and, and talk. Yeah. Um, and also thank you, David, for dropping in uh, before the show. I know he had he has a show that he has to drive for tonight. Yep. Uh, I'm see if you're in New York City, I'm plugging you, David. That's right. Uh, Omri, special thank you to you as well. For Omri, in. thank you so much for dropping in. Check out his YouTube channel. If you are interested in modular synthesis, modulate the modulations. That's that's Omri's thing. I love Extremely it. Extremely generous, detailed, and comprehensive use, you, YouTuber. Uh, extensively talking about sound design. I've applied so much that I learned from watching his streams to what I'm doing here. Amazing. And then you also had one more special visitor, right? Who is that that popped up? Jens in? from Device Meister. Device Meister is the, uh, is the uh, particular, I, and I didn't go into this even, there's even more detail to this, of course, because I have, um, I have this Device Meister. I'm actually using it to control Stokas as well, which is so I'm, I'm having it change things within Stokas. I, yes. I didn't get time to go into all of that. So if you send me the email thing, I don't know, maybe I'll start mailing people if there's enough yeah. to try. Yeah, there's an email here. So if you want to be in touch with Kevin, the gray is cool at gmail.com. Uh, shoot him an email. Um, and then Kevin, you're also in the community forums. The gig forum I, community I do forums. pop in there. Yes, I do so, pop in there. And um, it's such a friendly place. It's such an incredibly friendly online internet place. I highly recommend it. And yeah. the cost, the price of admission is a seat of gig performers so do yourself that favor yeah it's uh it's a wonderful place uh, it, it actually kind of surprises me I mean, i've been in the forums for a while but every time i go on there i'm like this is unusually good you, you can't believe how nice the people are <laughs> yeah and, and, I, and that's, that's, not, that's not me selling soap here i'm serious yeah it's uh, true i actually don't even know if you need a license to be on the forum so if you don't believe us go check out the forum oh i think yeah you're right you're right you can just all turn right, up friends. and see what it's all about Thank you so much for being here. We'll be back next week. Same time, 1130 Eastern Standard. Um, Kevin, this was awesome. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for everybody who's watching. Special thank you to Omri Cohen and Device Meister for being here. Um, we'll see you all next time. Oh, I love the playout music. <laughs> it's so good. Thank you.